I think the biggest thing you learn about poker is you learn about yourself. Bang, Perkins doubles up. Good him, Bill. Dude, you are a machine. They are just so f***ing caught up in the judgment of others. And I've been trained not to really give a f Like the human f***ing cheat code for life. I just had a moment of realization. I like it. <laughs> like I said, I'm a mistake-making machine, but I'm gonna try. So this jigsaw of life from now to the grave, I gotta figure that out too. How big of an impact can I have on this planet? You've recently said that your greatest fear isn't running out of money, it's wasting your life. Why is that something that terrifies you so much? It's one ride. It's like the most valuable thing to me that I have, right? Is my life, the choices, the experiences. And at each moment in my life, you have this chance to make the most of it and get what was out of it. And I remember in college, this kind of was cementing this fear. There was this article that came out like just when I was about to leave. Maybe it came out every year, but I, I finally read it in the paper. It was like 50 things to do before you graduate college. And I read this list and I was like really like sad because I was like, I haven't done maybe but one of these things. Things you should experience, like this college experience you should have at the University of Iowa. Obviously, you're not going to do all 50, but... And I was like, wow, I fucking wasted a significant portion of my college experience. This was my chance. Like, these are some of the fun things I could have done. These are some of the things, educational things I could have done. Some of the things that this university offers me and this time period in my life offers me that I didn't take advantage of. But you didn't waste any of your time. You just chose a certain way to live in a certain path. And... You chose not to do those other things. Like, how is that a waste? Yeah, I think that's bullshit. I don't think that I chose. I think a lot of the things we do is in a default mode network, which mm. is not a choice. It's just an operating system that gets us by. It's like when you're driving, when you first learn how to drive, you're choosing like, I must signal and the brake and you're panicking and you're thinking, you're deliberately thinking about everything you're doing. And by the time when you're driving, you may get home and not even know how you got there. You're, you're like way leaning back. You're making turns. You're sick. You auto signal. You don't think about doing these things. They're just automatic. And that's a great thing that we have the default mode network because we need to survive. We couldn't process all this information. Like these things just go into a subroutine and you just go through the action. And we have many of these subroutines going on. And pretty soon it's your whole life. It's just a subroutine. Yeah. It's not really a choice. And so what I had thought about at that time is that I didn't use the default mode network because I didn't know the default mode network at that time. I learned about the default mode network later, but I intuitively knew what the fuck was going on is that I autopiloted my way through college without mm. being deliberate and intentional about my time there. And so to say that I actually made a choice is just bullshit. I'm bullshitting myself. And a lot of people bullshit themselves. And that's just the way the human OS works. And so I felt that I had missed out on a lot of experiences had I really thought about it and been intentional about my time there. So you're, you're touching on something that I had to live with regret for a long time. So when I went to college, well, I went to a technical film school for 18 months. And I moved into the city. I lived with my aunt in her basement. She was nice enough to have a place for me. She had renovated this whole like little basement apartment. So I had my own place. Right. But I didn't stay on campus. I didn't stay in a dorm. So I lived with my aunt because it made sense, it made financial sense. Right. I took the bus. And when I went to school, I was still a bit of an achiever where I was like, grades matter. I've since figured out maybe grades don't matter that much, but it meant that I went to class and then I came home and I studied and I did my own thing. And then I'd go to class and come home and study and do my thing. Didn't do any extracurricular, like, didn't do anything related. To, like, when you say there's 50 experiences there in college, I didn't even stay on campus or in a dorm. And for a long time, I looked back and I regretted, oh, I missed out on something. And it's and I don't regret it anymore at all. The way I look at it is I'm the type of person at the time who wanted to focus on making the most of my investment, making the most of my time, focusing on hustle, focusing on getting ahead. Did I miss out on drinking? Sure. Or partying. But that was just who I am. And I did it. And off I go on to the next thing. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's did I live intentionally or did I not? And that's where the regret comes in. That's a good point. Had I looked back at my college years and this list and gone, no, I would have made the same exact decisions, right? I was living intentionally and I intentionally didn't do these things. And I didn't intentionally think about, hey, I didn't sit down and go, hey, what do you want to get out of freshman year? What are the experiences you want to have? What are the fun things? What are the courses you would never take that you should take just to expand your horizon? What are the social things you want to do? I didn't have that intentional thought process. And so that led to future regret. It's not the things you do. It's whether the things you're doing are intentional. 
or not? Did I default mode and just go through the motions of life or did I live life? You know what I mean? I'm here to thrive. We have this great operating system that will allow you to do a lot of things automatically. You don't even remember half the things you do to survive during the day, like breathing. But that's to me is not living. That's just surviving. And break that up in smaller parts. What was my living like at college? What is living to you then or even now? That's one of the hardest questions is knowing what you want and what experiences you want to have. So for me, it's a good portion of potluck and randomness because you don't know what you want. You discover what you want. Nobody comes out of the womb like, I like chocolate, I hate onions, I do whatever. I'm just naming the things about me, right? I want to do X, Y, and Z, or I love the Taj Mahal, or I hated this trip, or whatever. You go out, you process energy, you explore the world, and you discover what you like. And so a lot of life is discovery. And within that discovery, there's the things that you inherently know that you want. Like, And you have to get off autopilot to actually think about those things. Whether it be over some time period, like four years, weeks, months, or a day, right? And a lot of our lives are just in autopilot, which I talk about on the book, Die With Zero. But I fight being off on autopilot a lot. And autopilot is great because autopilot is the habits and things that I've created to make me successful at the things I do. I don't have to think about them, right? I don't have the mental processing power to constantly always refresh and go, oh my gosh, that's a cylindrical object protruding from a rectangular object and there's an outside. It's, oh, it's a doorknob, right? No. Everything that even resembles a doorknob or a handle, it's a handle and it goes into a bucket and you auto know what to do with it. And that's with everything, a certain trade, a certain pattern, a certain bet, a certain expected outcome. These things go into my default mode network and there's like a zillion of them that people have. And a lot of people that were like, where did the years go? What happened? Or why did I miss out on this opportunity or not do this? And I think a lot of people have a coping mechanism after the fact. Oh, I made my choices. I did my life the right way. And I do the same thing. And then I have to catch myself and go, oh, you're just bullshitting yourself. <laughs> you're just completely bullshitting yourself to make yourself feel good. You know what's interesting? I've uh, The last few months, I've become really happy because for the first time... I was telling my wife this the other day. For the first time, I feel like COVID is over. And I know that might not be the case for everyone, but I'm up here in Canada and we went into lockdown in 2020 and we went in and out of lockdown for like over a year. And we had all of these mandates and all of these things. And I'm not even talking about the politics of it. It's just, it was always present. Even last year at this time, we were in lockdown. And so the last few months, I've been taking my kids to soccer and there's like a few hundred kids on the field. No one's wearing masks. No one's thinking. No one's talking about it. We're going on vacations. We're traveling again. And for the first time, I got this sense. Like One, I thought that the world would never go back to the way it was. I was so sure. I was so certain. It's like the world has changed forever. We've lost something. For the first time, I'm starting to get the sense of, oh, maybe it's different, but we are going back and there is hope and there are things that can happen. But the biggest struggle I had was I don't remember most of 2020 or 2021. And I was trying to figure out why I don't remember most of it. And I've learned about this thing called prison time, which happens to prisoners, which is like when every day is the same, your brain just ignores similarities. If nothing novel, if nothing new, if nothing different happens, there's no reason to remember it. It just simply does not imprint it on your brain because it's like I didn't learn anything and nothing changed and nothing went different. So no need to imprint this. And I was living the same day over and over again, many of the days. And there was just, there wasn't the excitement, there wasn't the travel, there wasn't any of these things. And so if you ask me about milestones, it's like I can remember some stuff around Christmas, but I don't know what happened between October and December of 2020. I don't even remember. I don't know. And so it's like, one, man, our experiences are important. Is novelty important? Is change important? I've learned this because I just don't want to have to go through the drudgery of the same day over and over again. And so I want that life, yeah. especially now. But it sounds also on the other side, if I'm playing devil's advocate, it sounds like something that wealthy, that rich, that successful people can do later. Like it's just like if you're earning, if you're struggling, if you're starting something new, there's, there's no yeah. question for I, any I, of this. I think that's also the story and it's not bullshit, but it, it's overemphasized. I agree with the direction, not the magnitude that's out there. Everywhere I go. Every trip, every fantastic thing, everybody's like the glamorous life. Somebody's backpacking, hustling, and doing the same thing. 
and having a better life with no money. And some of the best stories, stories where I'm like, oh my God, I want your life. I want your story. People like, yeah, I drove cross country in my car and I saw this and I did this and I ate here and I hustled for this. And then I went to backpacking through Southeast Asia, et cetera. And I'm like, they're doing life better than me. They're actually doing it better than me. All the resources I have, everything I have, they're but, doing it better. You're comparing you to them. Isn't that comparing in itself? Setting an expectation that you're falling short of something that, frankly, it's just do whatever's you. I'm not comparing it to them in the sense that they're reaching out and going, getting what they want and they're doing things mm-hmm. that they want. So when I see something that somebody's doing that I'm completely capable of, but I'm getting distracted by all the minutiae and bullshit and I'm on autopilot, then I'm like, this is a valid comparison. It's not that I want to be them or their body or whatever. It's an inspiration. Kind of like you know, when I see people who work out and I'm not working out, they're an inspiration. It's like, I should be in shape. This is ludicrous. Oh man, like, they make me feel <laughs> I like reading about your move from 22% body fat to sub 10 in six months. I was like, so I went through my own cut one time yeah. and I'm like 20 pounds heavier than I feel like I should be. Yeah, seven, <laughs> so nine. But yeah. When I saw your stuff, I was like, how did he do it? Ah. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you how I did it is you, most of it was taking advantage of the default mode network and setting up habits and making it easy. Trying to remove motivation from it as much as possible. 85% of that is diet. So it's like, don't have the snacks nearby. You know what I mean? If I open up a bag of chips or peanuts and I put them on the table, people who are not hungry will eat the damn chips. Right. That's how powerful habit is. So a lot of that bet was just behavior design and designing to win. And then it really removed the motivation. Like I'm pretty lucky. Like I'm successful. I have money. So I bought a Peloton and I put it right upstairs. So there was never the excuse of, Oh, it's raining out. Oh, it's traffic. Oh, I can't go to gym or whatever. It's always there. The pull up bar always there. It's like right there. And so it just removed obstacles and made it easier. And part of behavior design is that, I don't know if you read the book by BJ Fogg, Tiny Habits, but anyway, it's a convergence of motivation, ability, and a prompt. And most technology, they focus on the ability part. The prompt is just a signal. It's just a reminder, like call grandma, or it's a signal to a person to do the activity that the thing that you want to do is available. So that's the reminder. And then there's motivation, which goes up and down, depending on whether you're tired, you went out last night, you're not feeling good or whatever. But ability is where all technology companies tend to focus. They try to make things as easy as possible for you to do the behavior. One-click buying, notification prompt design, et cetera. And the easier you make something, the more likely the behavior is to happen. And that's where all my focus was on this bet. A simple example is there's a lot of people stay up on their phone all night while they're in bed and not go to sleep and they'll put it on their nightstand and just go ahead and put your phone in your bathroom. There will be a drastic difference on how, whether you're on the phone and it's really easy to get out of bed. That's I feet sometimes for people to go walk up, open the door, go into the bathroom and get their phone because their bathroom is right next to their bed. But that small change in difficulty leads to a drastic change in behavior. You mentioned the bet. What happened? Uh, So my friend Dan bet me to get below 9% body fat by the time of my wedding. Of course, being a human being, I procrastinated to start anything until, well, there's the holidays and it's easy to eat with friends and family. So you overeat and Thanksgiving and then there's Christmas and et cetera. And then finally, I was like, I got four or five months to do this. I need to design. Now I just got a trainer. I was like, okay, now we're serious. Everywhere I go, there's got to be a Peloton, got my trainer, got my nutritionist, got whatever. And everything was essentially told to me. I was told what to do. You know, it's easy for me to follow instruction, like for me as a human being, do this, do that. And I removed as many obstacles, uh, things that were bad for my goal were removed. And things that were conducive to me making my goal were made as easy as possible. So my cardio was made as easy as possible. I would get a WhatsApp, do this class on your Peloton in the morning, do this class on your Peloton at night, X, Y, Z. No excuse. It's right there in my house. So I'm knocking out my cardio. I got fed. I didn't choose what I ate. I got fed with the nutritionist or whatever was prepped and made, et cetera. And so my nutritionist handle. There's no, oh, I don't know. Am I doing this right or whatever? Me doing it. It's yeah. like, no, I'm a machine. Feed me. And I ate at the proper times, let me the ask proper you. macros. Yeah, let me ask you. So two years ago during lockdown, yeah. I decided to do this thing I called the Chunk to Hunk Challenge. Right. 
And I think I was in the mid 180s at the time. At my heaviest, I was in my 240s. It never worked out. Didn't was never really fit. And then a few years ago, five years ago, my wife and I just decided to start exercising, getting fit. So flash forward uh, two years ago, I decided I'm going to do this chunk to hunk challenge, I say. And in 90 days, I asked my friend who was a trainer, what would it take for me to get abs for the first time in my life? Just what would it take? And he said, about 90 days, you have to follow a meal plan. You have to follow my workouts. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And so we got a nutritionist. I, w- I started lifting weights, even though I hadn't lifted weights before. I shifted my cardio and I did all that stuff. And it was so f***ing hard, man. It was four weeks in, I'd cut, I don't know, four or 5%. I think I got down from like 185 to like 172. My final weigh-in was like 168. And I think I was sub 10% body fat, but we didn't do an official thing. But it was so hard. And yet I made myself proud. Yeah. And I did it. And I just followed the instructions. And I did it for the 90 days. And at the end, I had like pictures and I felt great. And then since then, I've slowly just put weight on. And I've had so many false starts. I've gone like, I've done it once. I can do it again. I've done it before. I can do it again. Even after Christmas, New Year's, I sat down with my trainer. We had a whole plan. And I am so not on plan. (laughs) And I know there's meal prep and I know there's all this stuff. I almost can't imagine. I almost don't even know who that guy was who did that thing. You know, I'm not solving for maximum health and I'm not solving for maximum wealth and maximum time. I'm solving for maximum fulfillment. And so inherent in your decision is this is not fulfilling to me. This takes a certain amount of time rigor, et cetera, that you don't want to be slovenly, but you're like, I'm not trying to be a specimen of human existence, right? And that's okay. I just, I guess I'm not committed enough. (laughs) You don't like to be as much as you'd like to do other things. And I try to consciously make that decision. Where is optimal for me between I'm a pain in the ass to the people around me, even not enjoyable to be around versus my overall fitness, my health, my longevity, and how much that has an impact on every single experience, subsequent experience I'm going to have. And so it's a trade-off. So how do you quantify that? Because I was a total pain in the ass. My wife hated every minute of it. She even told me, you know, we've been together now 23 years. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. She told me for the first time in our entire relationship, she wasn't sure she wanted to be with me. Like That's how hard this was. I remember sitting there on an Easter. I made this whole Easter dinner, but I was on, I think, 1500 calories a day. Right. And so I'm, I make this dinner. My wife makes this pie. We have friends over and I just sat there miserably just chewing sugar free gum, sipping mint tea, just staring at them eating food like yes. miserable, ruining Easter for everyone, actually. So how do you figure out, like, how do you quantify maximum fulfillment? I want maximum fulfillment too. Yeah, I want to let go I, of the things that don't matter, but how do we figure this out? I don't think you ever get the exact number. For me, it's kind of, let's start getting some measurements. What are my doctors? What do the health say? Where should I be? If I'm like, hey, I want to be one of those guys who's go-go in their 70s, what do I need to look like in my 50s? You know, and start taking in data. Like I think uh, Peter Tia says, you lose about 1% muscle mass per year at the age of 40. Do you? Yeah. I heard someone say that you're only going to ever have as much muscle mass as you had when you're a teenager or something. No, that depends on what type of teenager you were. I say you're always declining after 33, right? You just weren't the best you could be at 33. But Mm. your muscle mass is declining. I'm saying the rate of decline is reaches 1%, I believe, in your 40s and keeps going. And strength is even more than that. And so if you think you're going to be like this go go guy in your 65, 70, you have to be at least at North American standards, in like top 2%, 5% person. Otherwise, you can just forget that. Like that idea of, oh, you're going to be super active or look like you're in a carnival commercial in your 70s is just out the window. Um, Yeah, my grandfather is 94, 93, 94. And he still walks. Uh, He's down in Florida right now. He still walks, I don't know, four or five miles a day on the beach. He has an indoor pool. He still swims every day. And me and my cousins, when we were in our teenagers, we looked up at my grandfather and we're like, wow, he's quiet, he's positive, he's stoic. And we're like, that's the life to live. And then we're in our 20s, we're looking at him. And we're in 30s, we're looking at him. And I feel like we all have this feeling like we're going to be able to have what he has. I mean, in terms of health, in terms of longevity, he's beat cancer twice. He's had all these issues to a certain degree, but he's still so strong. And then I look at the fact that he's never overeaten. He right. doesn't have any sugar. He's only ever eaten meat and potatoes because he's this European refugee. And he's lived a very humble life. And I'm like, huh, I'm not doing any of those things that he's doing. Right. So how the hell am I going to get to 94 like him? 
if I'm not putting in the time now. Yeah. And for each person, that's going to be a different choice. Maybe they don't want to be 94. Maybe they want to burn bright and go out early. Maybe they get so much fulfillment from eating ding dongs out of weight. That's the life they want to choose. You know, it's not for me, right? I have experiences that I want to have later in my life that I want to be healthy in and in shape for that I anticipate. And that will give me fulfillment. And therefore, as my ride here like, on Earth, like, what, what? like I would like to see my grandchildren and be able to play with them and take them places and take them on trips and go to whatever little kids want to do at that time, whether it be Disney World or Action Park or whatever the thing is at the time. And yeah. I don't want to be when I was all those like can't move, wheelchair, getting out, et cetera. And that means, hey, being overweight is really costly on your knees. I think for every pound of being overweight, it's five pounds of force on your knees. And so, you know, that repetitive stress takes out the cartilage and then you know, that causes pain. And then you're not walking, then you're even more weight. You get in this vicious cycle. And then visceral fat is like the, I think Peter Atiyah said it's the fourth horseman of disease. And so you know, it just starts to go exponential. It's like when your car is out of alignment, it can drive, right? Like it'll be wobbling or whatever. But eventually, you know, that thing's going to explode and the axe is going to fall off and all these problems are going to happen. Things are going to fall off, et cetera. So I want my body in line to go the distance to have these experiences later in life and not be unable to do certain things or still be able to do them, but not really enjoy them. So I won't do them. I went to St. Petersburg, obviously, before the war and before COVID. And one of the things that's great about these Eastern European countries, et cetera, and maybe a detriment is like, there's not this concept like you're going to get an accident and sue, right? They would never allow this in America. You get to climb the steps and walk around the balconies of these old churches, right? These old buildings right? have these amazing views. And I think it was like 111 steps up to one because they they marked them. I think it was a 111 or something. And I climbed the steps and we walked around. This is amazing. This is so beautiful. We're so grateful we're able to do this, et cetera. But one of the things I noticed when I looked down were all these tour buses, about eight, nine, 10 of them. All these older people between, I would say, 60 to on up, right? Getting off these tour buses and walking around and other older tourists, because that's what people do when they get older. They like to travel. Not a single one climbed those stairs. Not a single oh, one. And so I thought to myself, I was like, wow, they're not getting the same St. Petersburg that I am. I'm getting more of St. Petersburg. I'm having a more fulfilling trip. I'm getting more value out of my time here than they are. And so the first thing I thought is they chose the wrong time to come to St. Petersburg. The second thing I thought is that I need to be in shape that when I do more traveling in my life, that I don't miss out on these experiences that these cities have to offer that I want to go visit. And so you know, that's what hit me hard. That was my visceral experience of being there. The lesson I was learning, right? I was trying to learn the easy way, not the hard way, because like some people learn the easy way, some people learn the hard way, and some people never learn. And I think the easy way is learning from other people's mistakes and observations. And I'm a hard way learner. The hard way is learning from your <laughs> own mistakes, right? And then there's the never learners. Some people never learn. And with life, it's hard to learn the hard way because you, you miss out. I don't want to go through the being out of shape, not really taking care of my body and being 65. I don't get to do it over. I don't get to yeah. do my early years yeah. over so that I'm okay in my but, 60s and 70s. Sometimes it's, I don't want to say it's the only way to learn, but sometimes it's the only way for things to become important enough for you to realize their importance. And then when they happen, all you can do is sweep them up and fix them and correct them oh, and not beat yourself up for having made those mistakes. Don't, don't hard judge way yourself oh, yeah. for being a hard way learner, do you? I think certain things that you have to experience, right? Like you, yeah. you can't go to, uh, there's no PhD class on bicycle riding. You got to ride the bike. You know, I can have a guy who I've done 10 years of learning about bikes and the physics of bikes and aerodynamics. <laughs> I could spend 10 hours with my daughter teaching how to ride a bike. And then I'd be like, okay, we're going to have a 200 yard dash on this bike. Go. My daughter's going to smoke the guy because right? he's still, his body's still got to figure it out and get it, whatever, no matter how much he's learned about the bike. Yeah. And so, I think that's way in love. Some of the things you'd be like, don't do this, dude. We're telling you, man, she's whatever with this or whatever, and yada, yada. And they just got to go through it. And you're like, yep, you got to, you get some stoves, you, yeah. some hot stoves, you got to touch. But to the extent that I can learn from my observations, other people's experiences, it's a human cheat code. It's kind of like, go imagine you're in heaven and before you go down as a baby, the people are coming back who have died. Yeah. 
And they're like, heads up. Give me, give me the good stuff. Like what, give me the do's and don'ts. Like give me, give me the stuff, give me the good stuff. Right. And the fact of the matter is you don't have to have that happen in heaven. There are people who are 90, 80, 75, et cetera. There's books, studies. Like what are your regrets in life? Five, five regrets of the dying by Bonnie Ware. Yeah, have you read there's that? one book, but there's literally enough. And we call that anecdote or because pretty soon enough anecdotes become data and then data becomes analysis. And then analysis allows you to take action. And so there is so much data and analysis on people that are at the end of their life or living their life about regrets, things they didn't do, et cetera, that are consistent, that are not contradictory, that you can take from that. You got yeah. like the human fucking cheat code for life. And so some of that is you can just watch and see, and you can go to Japan and see, wow, these people are in shape. Not that many overweight people. They're very active. They're 80 people walking around shopping, doing stuff, hobbies or whatever. And then you can go to another country like the United States of America and you can see the difference, right? Like, can't move people. <laughs> obesity is a problem. People in chairs dying early, et cetera. And healthcare expenditures through the roof. And one of the reasons that healthcare expenditures are through the roof, the United States of America is not... The unit cost, it's that we have such great technology to keep you alive for an extra two years at this level of function. And so they're spending like a zillion dollars to keep you alive for two years at the end of your life. I think 58% of our healthcare expenditures in the United States are for chronic diseases, preventable ones, diet and lifestyle, basically. And so you can learn from that, right? And you can decide which life you want to live. And I don't even fault people that are like, nah, I just want to go the eat donuts route. I'm like, listen, if donuts fulfill you and that's the life you want to live, how about it? Have you heard the uh, Warren Buffett car analogy? Are no, you familiar I, with that? No, I have not. So Warren Buffett allegedly said that he would buy you, listeners, viewers, he will buy you any car you want. He'll buy it for you, free and clear. But the thing is, it's the only car that you get to have for the rest of your life. Now, how are you going to treat that car? You want the Lamborghini? You want the truck? Whatever you want, but it's your only car. So you're going to maybe do some maintenance. You're going to maybe polish it. Maybe you're going to watch you know, the mileage on it and not put it needlessly run up the mileage or what have you. Maybe you're going to buy a more dependable one. I don't know. But he says, basically... Your body and your mind is that car. Correct. It's, yeah. It is what you have for the rest of your life. And one of my favorite comedians, Jimmy Carr, wrote in his book this idea that if future you wants to have more money, current you can do some things to give future you more money. <laughs> if, if future you wants to have a richer life experience, then what are you doing today? If future you wants to live a healthier, happier life, what are you doing today? If you right. want more right. cognition, what are you doing today? Um, I get it. And I love it. I still struggle maybe with the peanut butter sandwiches and whatnot, but, but I get it. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely there. And there's this battle between future you and current you about who gets what. And the totality of you, the totality of all of you is up to the day you hit the grave. What does that look like? So let's go back to this bet you made about your health because yeah. it seems like you have a fairly high risk profile. It seems like you're pretty comfortable with gambling or with bets on your time right. in finance. No one wants to say it's speculative or betting, but you have been known for, you know, Doing these large investments, you know, you're a professional poker player. That's 100. I'm, I'm, I'm not a professional, but yeah. <laughs> so the million dollar pots and stuff that that doesn't make you technically no, a professional. I don't make my living doing that. I think in tournaments I'm net up and cash games I'm net down, but that still doesn't make me a professional. It's just a lot okay. of money. A lot of money. Okay, so so you're a very good poker player, and then you took this health bet, and you know, it was a lot of money. Wasn't yeah, it? definitely. How much did you make on the health bet? I think between all bets, like quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million. Now that's also good motivation to get to sub at nine percent. Yeah, yeah. depending on wherever you are, like whatever the bet is, human beings aren't really good at what I call net present value. We're good at immediate rewards and immediate dangers, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody uses the the lion run or food, sugar, good eat. We're not good at hey, this is a repeatable long term effect and accumulative effects of me eating this sugar is going to destroy me or those type of dangers like smoking, right? These things that are small changes, gaining weight, like people one day wake up and they notice and it's a year later and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm 40 pounds overweight. If you do the math, I think I have a calculator. I think give or take like 36 pounds overweight is just an extra 200 calories a day. They say 500 calories, 2,500 calories per pound, I think. 3,500. 3,500. 3,500 per pound. Yeah. 
25 divided by 3,500. Sorry, that's 20 pounds. So 200 calories, 200 calories a day extra is you'll be 20 pounds overweight, 20 pounds of fat, give or take. And so that's significant on someone's body, right? And that's nothing. Like you go look at anything or you buy and it's like... But then the inverse is... The inverse works true. It works in your favor, right? So you can easily, (laughs) you can go the other way, right? You can have that net caloric deficit of 200 over a year and you can drop 20 pounds. But we're not wired for net present value. Like the sum total of all these actions, what is that worth to me right now? Or future value with the sum total of all the cigarette smoking is a lot of vitamin P, polonium in my system. And the radiation is additive and that has this issue. Like my grandfather died at 60 from lung cancer from smoking. And bets are immediate. The reward is a bunch of money, right? It's right there. So even if it's a certain percentage of your net worth, that reward system, as opposed to the future you being in great shape a year and a half from now, is more powerful just to our wiring, the way we're wired. And so that's why when you bet somebody to do something, they're more likely to do it, even though the health value of them doing it without the bet would be even greater than the bet. The net present value of me being in shape, of me losing 20 pounds, right, is way greater for me than the 250 gram bet. By a so, lot. so do you say, let's just realize this and start putting ourselves in situations with these fun bets because we know it's a cheat code? Or do we go... Oh, I know this. And you figured out some kind of way to reprogram yourself for these slow wins over time. I think it's just a work around the human OS around that NPV. Like this immediate reward system is closer. So that gets you that high motivation. And then that starts the process of developing the habits. Like, how do I design my life? And then what you're hoping is after the bet, the designs and the systems that you set up and the things that you learn, they last for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. If you don't set up a system and habits and a design, you are more likely to just balloon back out to where you were. But if you set up habits, a system of designs and learnings, you may drift, but you won't drift as far and you'll be in shape. Let's switch away from health to poker. (laughs) Like I don't play. I used to play for pennies. And when I was a kid, we used to play Texas Oldham was like the game of choice or whatever. And I always gambled way too aggressively, way too quickly and lost everything. And then if we're playing for Smarties or Skittles or something, I'd be like (laughs) eating my pot. So I don't really know much about it other than I used to watch a lot Right. Celebrity Poker. Do you remember that TV show that used to be on in the yeah, 90s? Yeah, yeah. That's way back when. Yeah. <laughs> I used to watch a lot of that in the afternoons. But I do know that aside from the reading people and the game and the negotiations, it's my understanding is about like patience and about letting things slide by and knowing when to go in and not go in. And that has to have lessons that have taught you in these other areas of life and business and other things, right? Yeah, I think the game has evolved a lot with the advent of solvers. And so a lot of the game was in the early days was like a lot of reading people. And I just don't think you have it, son. That kind of thing. A lot of human behavior and obviously the odds and the statistics. And with the advent of solvers. What's a solver? Solvers are computer programs that tell you what the optimal play is for poker. And so the optimal play of poker is always a mixed strategy. So let's say you dealt ace king, right? A certain percentage of the time pre-flop, you're going to go all in. A certain percentage of the time, you're going to call. A certain percentage of the time, you're going to raise. You're going to do different actions. And as a human being, you don't have the memory or the bandwidth to play like a computer because it knows what to do at a certain frequency each time. And it has a random number generator and it does it. And therefore, it is unbeatable over time. But what these solvers have shown you is that there is a kind of perfect way to play. And if someone is doing some activity at a frequency that is not at perfect, you can exploit them. And when I say exploit them, this is win their money. And so without going to poker, a lot of people don't know what poker is or what the rules are. Let's talk about rock, paper, scissors. Most people, if I, I ask the question, what's the perfect way to play rock, paper, scissors so nobody can exploit you, they would say, a third rock, a third paper, a third scissors, right? Nobody can know what you're going to throw. Scissors every single time because people go to rock or paper way too often. Like that's playing exploitive. That's exploiting what other people do. But if you're saying, I, you can't exploit me, we're going to play a million times and you just randomly okay. throw out rock, paper, scissors, somebody, people can't exploit you. But let's say you throw out paper. 
too much. And let's say the other guy's playing perfectly, throws up paper, throws up rocks, and you always throw paper. The game is still neutral. Nobody wins any money, right? Because you throw out paper one time, he throws out paper one time, tie. You throw out paper one time, he throws out rock, you win. You throw out paper one time, he throws out scissors, he's win. So if you add those all up, it's net and even, no money is changed. So the, the idea is that when you throw out paper, and I notice that you throw out paper at a higher frequency, I exploit yeah. you minimally. If you're throwing out paper, then I'm going to throw out scissors just a little bit more so that I'm winning money over time, but not so much that you learn that what's going on. <laughs> Do you see what's going on here? Uh, yeah, I just had a moment of realization. I like so it. So that's the exploitive aspect of poker. And so what these solvers have said is, oh, like, wow, this guy is folding to a bet on the river more than he should be. You can just blindly bet a little bit more, even when you have it, bluff a little bit more on the river because he's going to overfold. But how are you finding this information? Yeah, you're watching your opponents. And if you're playing online, right, it's easy. Like the numbers are there, the stats are there, et cetera. But when you're playing the game, you're, you're noticing like, hey, this guy is overfolding. Now, when you play the game, you're supposed to have X amount of hands to play that are reasonable to play from each position. The earlier the position, the less hands that you're going to open with or play. And the later the position, the more hands you're going to play. If someone is playing too many hands in the beginning, by definition, they will have more garbage later on in the streets and they will be an over bluffer. Okay. Does that make sense? Like when they're betting, yeah. they just have too many garbage hands. They do have too many bluff combos. If they're super tight and they don't play that many hands, by definition, they should be a under bluffer or the theoretically, right? And so I'm really simplifying it and I may have gotten some little things on around the edge, but that's like where poker is headed is that it's removing a lot of the guesswork. And I don't think you got it, son, to more of a statistical analysis and exploitation game. And really now people, the pros are like, they're practically robots. They're more like chess players who are learning all of these different combinations yeah, and all like of these different chess. possibilities. It's like limited information chess. It's most likely he would have castled. I can't see his pieces, but it's most likely he would have castled. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, he's an over opener on E4. And so these chess players are people who just really study a lot and study what is the proper play, what's called game theory optimal play at each scenario. And how would I play this situation so I wouldn't be exploited? And how is this person in a global environment? How are they playing and how am I going to exploit them? I don't have the time to learn all that. Right? Like I've learned it a little bit. It's, yeah. It takes away a little bit of the fun and the mystery of poker. But it's also very intriguing because this is kind of life, right? Like in negotiations. Yeah. And, and so what have you learned there that you apply and how have you applied it to the other areas of your life or business? I think that even without like going into wizardry school and trying to learn GTO, et cetera, I think the biggest thing you learn about poker is you learn about yourself. The cards are the same. It's not the card's fault. It's not whatever. It's how do you react in certain situations? And that's a poker pro a while ago. He says, you know what? A lot of the times you know what the right play is to do, but you still do the wrong thing anyway. And he, that's your leak. He said, that's what it is. What is driving you to make these plays? I thought that was like a really great observation because it's, wow, I really like this doing fun or I really like putting pressure on people. So I'll just do it. I can't help myself. I'm like, oh, I just have to do this play, right? And it's really about my psychology and your own psychology versus your knowledge of the game or et cetera, right? Obviously, there's a knowledge of the game and knowing the right to do the right thing. But there's when you know how to do the right thing or when you get in these spots, do you actually do the difficult thing that you're supposed to do? Or do you do something crazy? Or do you shy away? Are you risk averse? Or are you too big of a risk taker? What are your patterns? Like, how do you react? And that's the same thing with trading. Like, it's a mirror. It's a lot less money for me on the line. And it's not the market. It's how do you react to the market? Everybody gets the same information trading. I'm a fundamental trader. I do a little bit more studying, a little bit more homework. I have some information, but it's like, how do I react? How does my analysis differ? How can I see the same set of information and my analysis is different? Is there some sort of bias I have in myself here that sees that? Is this latent pattern recognition that I have? And so 
poker has taught me to be even more stoic when it comes to finance, uh, trading, et cetera. I was wondering when we would hit objectivity yes. uh, and saying that you know, poker players are basically robots. And even what you're mentioning, it almost seems if you can scrub the emotion away from it. I'm working through Meditations by Marcus Aurelius right now, one of the original uh, Stoic speakers. And I got onto this book because I respect the hell out of Tim Ferriss. And I love Ryan Holiday's work. And so whenever I hear the two of them speak and they mention a book, where they're like, oh, I love this book. I'm like, well, if I respect them, I should read what they're reading. And so have you been able to or do you really remove emotion? You mentioned stoicism. So are you able to get yourself to a really objective place where you can remove emotion from gambling, from betting, from the game, from running your business, from the bets that you're taking? Traders in general are wired a little bit differently emotionally in the EQ. They generally, they're not the brightest guys in the world. They're very bright, but they're not. it's not like people from MIT are the best traders or the professor here or there. It's because I believe that there's this study that's done that the average person needs like, I don't know, five to seven positive events to make up for one negative event. And you've seen this in relationship books. If you get in a fight with your wife or you say something like it's not, doesn't matter how big a gift you did, you need five to seven positive things to make up <laughs> the one negative. And a lot of people, like if they had a bad day or something bad, they, there's this kind of lopsided emotional calculus. You can't survive in trading with that. Like the best traders in the world are like ever 60, 40, right? I'm right. I'm wrong all the time. 40% of my days are bad days. Some of them are very bad days. So imagine how that emotional calculus won't work, right? Like I have 40 times five, right? 200 versus... 60 bad days, like I'm out of mess. And when you are brain can't work that way, where you're having this emotional duress, then everything else starts to fall apart. Like if you're under stress and motion, right? Like you don't think clearly, not logically, and then just spirals out of control or the, the, it just doesn't become worth it. People quit. I just can't take this crying when they're down, et cetera. And I, most traders don't have that. Right. And then I think for me, especially. <laughs> Particularly with money, I don't really think the downside is that bad. I'm not afraid to go broke. I don't really, I don't have a fear of, or I want to say I don't have a fear. I don't have zero fear, but I would say that I have close to zero fear of what other people think. Like, I don't get most of the people that I've met that have an opportunity or an idea, chance to move or et cetera, they don't take the job or the risk or do, do the business deal because of they can't stomach the financial risk. They don't really have the skills to execute. What they do is have a fear of judgment of their friends if they fail. Their friends, their peers, their mothers, whatever. And, and of themselves. People are very hard on themselves too. And it's that fear of judgment which really holds people back in all kinds of ways. And it's not just finance. It's like love. Right. Some people just don't say I love you first or express their feelings because they are afraid of getting rejected. And what are they going to think? Oh, I'm going to look like an idiot. Oh my gosh. How could you? I'm not in love with you, you clown. Oh. you sleeping with this dude or whatever. So that fear is such a limiting factor in people. And so they don't get into the arena to then have the chance to succeed. I am unleashed from that. You were born broken or you figured out how to crush no, no, it? I have the superpower that like, I just don't give a fuck. Like, I don't care what you think. And part of that was like, I think it's wiring. And part of that is cultural. I think a lot of it's cultural. My dad was very much that way. And also, I think like, I was born in 69. Dad was born in, I don't know, 40s? I was born in 40s? 40s, whatever. So he grew up during segregation, institutionalized racism, et cetera. I grew up like at the tail end of that, right? I was born when I think King got shot. And as a kid, late exposed to a healthy dose of racism, like overt racism. And on the exchange floor was like one of the most sexist and racist places that ever was. But we're progressing and things are getting better. Like my kids, they're not having the same experience that I had. I can never have the same experience my dad had. And my dad can never have the same experience that my granddad had, right? One of the things that that trained me for is like when people are like, I'm black people and they're always stealing and blah, 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 and just talking shit to you all the time about who you are, et cetera, not knowing who you are, right? You learn to like, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I don't care what you think. What ifs? Like you get the what ifs. Like you don't care. Like I'm not going to stop being black because you're like, oh, black people. You know what I mean? This, that, right? And so... 
that kind of transfers over because I'm not going to stop being who I am or what I want to do or want to reach out because I fear your judgment. And put a chip on your shoulder though or anything. Eh? Yeah, I had enough judgment already. Like I've been pre-prepped for like judgment and failure and thinking this. So why do I give a f- what people think? You know what I mean? And so that at the time, I didn't know that. But now I look back, I'm like, wow, man, that was great training. Like, I'm glad I had that. And it's just anecdote me talking, but I know people that don't have that. They're like, oh, man, what am I mom? And if I fail and whatever, this is a nice job and I'm going to stick with this job and whatever. And I'm going to not chase my dreams because, oh, what if it goes wrong or whatever? And it's like, you can always get enough job, dude. You can always get this. You know what I mean? Like you have a degree or whatever. Like you, you're not, there's no downside for you. The only yeah. downside is he didn't f- get you. The venture failed. They're really just worried about, oh, my, my friends think it's a bad idea. My mom thinks it's bad. Like this is a bad idea. They are just so f- caught up in the judgment of others. And I've been trained not to really give a f- And it's great. So then aside from not living every moment of your life as the most bright moment it could be, what are you afraid of? It's not the most bright. I want to hit the great maximum fulfillment. You said, I think the hard thing is the biggest problem I have is what is maximum fulfillment for me? What do I really (laughs) want? Because I've been programmed. Most of the things I like are programming. It's cultural, it's cultural programming, right? I just use the example. I don't eat crickets on a stick because I wasn't raised in China, but I'm, I bet you if I was raised in China, crickets on a stick, I'd be like, dude, can we get some crickets on a stick? I'm really hungry for some crickets on a stick. Like it's what I like, what I do, a lot of it's programming and and trying to get in touch with, okay, this is a program I actually like. This is good programming. I'll take this programming. What do I really enjoy? What do I really want in my life? Not what I've been advertising, what I want, and not the commercials and not whatever. What really fulfills me? What adventures do I want to have? What scars am I willing to have in order to go over these adventures? You know, that's the hard thing. And so you have to like and really think about that and detach and get off autopilot and get off the default mode network and be like, this is what I want. Then you go out and now I've got a loose idea of experiences I want to have. When is the best time for me to have them? Because it's not just what you want. Because life is a jigsaw puzzle. It's like Tetris. I got to get the order right. No, it's not. I want to climb Mount Everest. Let's save that to 85. Hey, I want to go clubbing and go to strip clubs. Let's not save that until when I'm married. Let's do that before I'm married. You know what I mean? Like whatever it is, right? Like, Like when you have small kids, it changes what is available to you and when the optimal time is. And if that period is a long time, then it might push you into another period, et cetera. So this jigsaw of life, like from now to the grave, I got to figure that out too. Oh, this is so good. You've just unlocked something. My wife and I got married very young. Now she was 21. Yeah, she was 21. I was 22. We had my daughter when we were 23. So we just started young. We got married young. But one thing that we always loved was when we got together, we had nothing. So we had nothing to fight over. We didn't have independence. We didn't have disposable income. We didn't have money. We hadn't gone out and partied. And so when we got married, we didn't actually feel like we lost any of our independence because we never had it. When we had kids, we never felt like we lost or sacrificed anything because we never had it. And every step of them getting older is more freedom for us, actually. And we would look at our friends who lived through their 20s or even their 30s single and then got married and felt like it was a sacrifice and then had kids and mourned the loss of their freedom. And I always thought, oh, we did this right. They did it wrong. And what you just helped me realize was... They were just doing it without intention. There's no right or wrong order to this. Right. It's simply, if you're going to get married, be intentional about being married. Don't look at what you've quote unquote lost. If you're going to have kids, be intentional about the family. Don't say, oh, I've lost my freedom or disposable income or whatever it might be. And it comes back to just being intentional about it. Yeah. Do you really want kids or is that, are you just following the cookie cutter mold of your culture? Yeah. And it's really hard to detach from your culture and your programming, but you need to do that in order for it's extremely hard. People are like, yeah, I would have never owned slaves. I'm like, yeah, right. It's the culture of the time. It's powerful. People are making excuses. They become dependent on it and then they rationalize. Bill Burr, Bill Burr is the best. I don't know if you listen to his comedy or not. He's no. the best at setting that up. You know, he talks about how the owner of, I don't know, some kind of LA team, I think it was the football team, was being racist a bunch of years ago uh, because he talked about how he wanted more, I think, Black people on his team because he felt that they were better aggressive players. And that was super racist. And 
Bill Burr was saying the dude's in his like 70s or 80s. So you got, you got to keep in mind, like when this kid yeah. was growing up, like yeah. in 1935, when he was growing up, what he said was not very racist no, compared no, no. to compared to today. They're programmed. I mean, he's part of his program. Like a lot of my beliefs about... How do you attack it? Like, do you journal? Do you question everything? How do you assess it? I try and stay out of echo chambers. I'm always open to... As a trader, you got to follow the data. And as the data changes, your mind has to change. So I think it forces you in other areas to be open to changing your mind. And I think even in social areas, it changed my mind. And, and some of it's just getting to like root core principles. And is this consistent with my root core principles that I've adopted? I used to be one of the kids like, oh, being gay isn't right. And it was just the culture. Like kids call each other faggot or whatever and like make fun. And then realize I had debate arguments with someone in college. And it was just like, how can an act of love be wrong? How could it be a sin? And I was like, okay, a nonviolent act of love, right? And I was like, that's a good point. Let me think about that. Let me go wrestle with that. And it's like, why don't I have the freedom to be who I am? Whether you agree with it or not. I was like, yeah, you're right. Core principle of freedom and choice. And then as my like, worldview inculcated from like the past from the late 60s or whatever like as this movement and they're fighting for their rights not only is it hey you're not going to attack me but you're going to accept it and i'm going to be a face i'm not going to hide in the closet of who i am and be who i am and i got on board with that i was like holy shit i've had a totally fucked up cultural view on this issue for my life that just came out of osmosis, right? Just the times and the, and the jokes on TV and the movies and whatever. And I was just like, this wasn't well thought, intentional and thinking on freedom and being who you are and everybody should, what do I care on my core principles? This was just bullshit that was just passed down through generations and generations, right? And so I realized like the way for me to get out of that bullshit is to be out of my echo chamber, Differing views. That doesn't mean every single one of them would be like, no, I agree with you. you know, I'm not a windsock, right? I'm not going with any way the wind blows, but I'm open to having different ideas, different viewpoints come in that will shift my position on issues in line with my core principles. And then occasionally, I don't know, I look at my core principles and like, is this who I want to be? <laughs> and you even question that. I do. At a higher level of what is it to be human? What is the human experience? Like a lot of people have these questions, like these kind of existential questions. Like, what is it to be human? I remember one time I was watching a movie with my sister. It was like the scenario was like one of those disasters, whatever. And they were going to kill the person to eat the other person or whatever. It was one of those zombie type movies. And my sister goes, why wouldn't you just die a human? And it was just like a movie comment, whatever. And I thought about that. And I thought about, yeah, if I was in that scenario, am I going to fucking not be a human to try and survive another day? Or am I going to go out on this planet, come in a human, die a human, not an animal? I thought that was very powerful. Yeah. And then asked the question, what does it mean to be a human? How do I feel about these dire situations? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to die a human. I'm not the guy who's going to kill the baby or the weak person to eat him. Other people can go ahead and survive. I'm just going to go out and die a human. Everybody's got to die. I'm a die human, that type of thing. And so I look at these things and sometimes is my OS, this organic meat suit I wear, is that my humanity? Is it attached or is it my consciousness? And how does that relate? You know what I mean? Like, And all these kind of weird questions that you may have, right? That may poke at your core principles and philosophies. Like the simple ones, the everyday ones, like freedom, non-aggression. You're asking them, do you chase the discomfort? Because... I've learned that when I'm afraid to hit something, a question I'm asking myself, a value, a belief, when I'm too nervous to say it out loud or tell someone about it or even write myself a note, I'm like, ooh, there's something there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's happened, but unfortunately, I just <laughs> I don't have that big of a filter. I'm not afraid of looking like an <laughs> idiot. So, so it's hard for me to get uncomfortable. I'm just like, oh, I said something stupid. Yeah, it was stupid. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to fuck up many times. Like I'm a mistake making machine and I call myself like the new and improved mistake making machine LX 5000. I'm like the latest, greatest version of it. Want to hit the grave with scars. I do believe this and maybe some way I'll change this. But if I don't, you know, have scars or burning, I'm not really trying hard enough. And I remember when I was in high school, Webb was one of our teachers. And one of the things he says, you don't know your limits until you hit them. I don't know why I remember that, but he just said, I was like, don't like we, he was talking about limits and he was like, you know, he was like, no one here knows their limits because they haven't hit them until you've broken. You don't know them. 
I was like, shit. And I've thought about that often. And I was like, shit, I want to hit the grave with scars. Obviously, I got to fucking hit some. I don't want to die early, but like, I want to know how big I can love. And I know how big, what kind of risk and how big I can dream and business wise and financial wise and philanthropic and how big of an impact can I have on this planet and things like that. And how much big fun can I have? How deviant can I be? You know what I mean? What new crazy shit can I try and get away with before I hit the grave? Every (laughs) single area of my life, whether it be the hedonistic side or the altruistic charitable side or the creative side or the the et cetera, I kind of want to poke, find some limits in some of those areas. I think what's most inspiring is that you do it. So you're willing to throw yourself in there because I guess you don't judge yourself if the outcome doesn't go the way you want. And you're willing to work for it. You're willing to claim that you want it. You're willing to try it. You're willing to do it. What makes you so badass at all the different things you've done is it is you just do it. Right? Sometimes, like I said, it's discovery. Like sometimes you're just doing it. I don't even know if I like it. I'm doing it to discover if I like it. And I'm, I'm going to do it. I might as well look. And then I half-ass it. And the funny thing is, is, I say to people like, oh man, you throw great parties. This is a good party. I said, listen, I half-ass a lot of things. I won't half-ass a party. I'm one of those, the purpose of life is to enjoy it to be happy, the Dalai Lama type of guy. And I'm like, I'm not going to half-ass that. Like, I'll half-ass my calculus homework. I'll half-ass this, maybe even a workout. But I'm not half-assing the happiness part. That's like crazy. That's crazy. And then yeah. like, that spilled over with my lovely wife. It's like, learned the hard way, but I'm not going to half-ass love. I'm not going to half-ass loving her. I'm trying to go as big as I possibly can till it breaks. Like to, to get to what I'm most close, nobody... I'm a religious guy, but as close to that God love that you can get. And that's it. And then the key thing is like, when you say that, okay, what does that mean? How do you execute? Like a lot of times, a lot of people have a lot of great ideas, whether it be on love or working out or whatever. Those are a dime a dozen. It's really execution. And so it's like bringing in resources and having an execution plan to like, what are the concrete steps you're going to do to get there? Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. I'm going to fuck up a lot of them. Like I said, I'm a mistake-making machine, but I'm a try. 